right, well, we covered night uno. Let's go to night dos. This was April 7th, the Sunday night of the crowning achievement of WrestleMania. And the weather was warmer. It was 61 degrees instead of like 52 or whatever with a 48 degree wind chill. And God Bless America was performed by The War and Treaty. That is an odd name, is it not? I mean, I guess the two things go together. You can't have a treaty without having a war first, but would you have named your duo the War and Treaty? Is he war and she's treaty? I don't know whether that was clearly delineated, but also how come if he's the war and she's treaty, then he gets to be the war where she's just treaty. That would be like the Batman and Robin. I don't know, the war, that kind of works, but either way, not familiar with them, but they did a great job. I thought it was really good. They have, they have some lungs on them. And then here came the other half of the Levesque power couple, Stephanie McMahon, the good one, as we mentioned. She got the entrance, no, no backlash. I think people have now... They identify her, as again, as we said earlier, as part of the Levesque bloodline, and she said she's the most proud of this WrestleMania of all of them, it's, as it's the first of the Paul Levesque era. And then she That's, led the fans in chanting, thank you, Vince. No, no, come on. Don't tell the people who might not have said that. You'll spread malicious rumors. She actually said she jumped onto somebody else's tagline. She said, are you ready? And in here came WrestleMania. And suddenly, we had about 50 bagpipers and drummers and swordsmen and lords a-leaping and ladies dancing. And here came Drew McIntyre. And Punk on commentary said sacrilege because they were playing <laughs> Piper's theme song. They weren't just playing any song. They were playing what Piper would come out to. I, I try not to listen when the bagpipes go, except if it was Roddy playing them. And yeah, and, and uh, Punk jumped his introduction because he's like, cut that off, cut that off. Uh, but Punk was there joining Michael Cole, Corey Graves, and Pat McAfee, our broadcasters for both nights, did a, a fine job. And Punk was wearing a suit. Looked like he had just come from a funeral. You don't, you don't see some people in suits that often. A bit, lawsuits, maybe, but not, not the regular kind. And then for Seth, <laughs> George Clinton's worst acid flashback appeared on the stage. The Philadelphia Mummers is what they were. It looked like a few of them would give you a hummer as they were mumming there. <laughs> is, that where, is that what you thought watching the, them? The, the Mummers looked like, a few of them looked like some hummers. I can't believe you just said hummers on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and... This, it was oh. ridiculous. This scene was ridiculous, but I mean, you know, it was a spectacle. People have, you're going to do it, do it at WrestleMania. And we had Seth versus Drew, but we were 20 minutes into the, into the show before the bell rang on this one. And immediately, boom, Drew McIntyre comes out with a Claymore kick and gets a two count. And then with this match, and I got to tell you, I liked it. It worked. But they were doing the Brock Lesnar Big Show match playbook, weren't they? Where they it was just it was built around the big moves, the stomps, the suplexes, the claymore kicks, the pedigrees, a lot of two counts, and then selling. But it worked, I thought. And you know, I'm not again going to go blow by blow on all of these back and forth, but they did it creatively and and they got all of their moves in multiple times but there was a reason for each kick or each move failing if it did and then finally drew had uh cleared off the announce desk and punk at that point was calling it in his headset but he was calling it so like drew could hear him when he was talking bad about him and Seth fought up and gave uh, Drew the stomp on the desk, rolled, uh, rolled him back in, but Drew McIntyre hit a kick and got a two count, and then another kick and got a three count. And that was the only, 
The only thing, it was an exciting match with an eh, finish because he just survived Seth Rollins' finish on the announce desk. And 15 minutes after that, he hits two kicks and beats him. Or 15 seconds, I should say, not minutes. He, he hits two kicks and beats him. But otherwise than that, as a match before we go to the afterbirth, this was a nice, it was a nice uh, peppy goddamn way to to get the people going at the start. I liked it. What'd you think? Good match. I figured Drew would win. So up to that point, I thought it was great. Not to say that anything after it wasn't, but I thought it was good. And had a good WrestleMania moment. His wife at ringside. Yeah. Got to show her the belt. So he got to have that moment in front of fans. Whereas Seth was just showing people his Hummers. Boy, Seth just did nothing but put other people over this entire WrestleMania. But, but uh, because good, some, good things are, some things are bigger than ourselves. But it was a good match. And then there was a celebration because when we predict Drew McIntyre would win this belt. And then Drew and Punk started making smart ass remarks to each other because Punk has obviously been on color this whole time he's still there and then drew gets over he like he's crawling over the desk he's gonna menace punk and punk's got that brace on his arm even over over the top of his suit jacket and and then finally drew stood up on the desk right in front of punk and crotch chopped him and turned around and laughed about it and punk leg sweep jerked his feet out from under him and bam drew takes a bump on the desk and then Punk takes off the brace and the fucking jacket and gives Drew a clothesline with the fucking brace and kicks the shit out of him. Or starts kicking the shit out of him. And suddenly, the music plays in, and here comes Damian Priest with the Money in the Bank briefcase. And he nails Drew McIntyre with the briefcase, rolls him in, cashes in, hits the choke slam. One, two, three, and he's the new world champion. And CM Punk has taken away Drew McIntyre's moment of triumph at his world title win and fucking facilitated the goddamn thing going over to Damian Priest, and Drew McIntyre can't fucking believe it. And so now they've heated that program. And I got to be honest with you, I don't know if Drew or if Damian as Priest is going to have that belt long or if he's going to do much for it but we didn't see this coming and that was the biggest thing they could do to uh, to heat up drew and punk which is going to be money as soon as punk's ready does drew come back and beat damian priest on raw i don't fucking know after a while i'm not talking about tomorrow but uh you know <laughs> They heated up a money match that they've already got waiting on them. I don't know what's going to go on with the world title. But I like this. This deal was a nice little surprise. This was great. It was a great way to open the show. I guess the question is, how much longer is Punk on the shelf? Because if you can't start building him and Drew into a match that could happen anytime soon, who is Drew going to work with? And then, well, with, and then with Rollins coming out of this, again, another guy they teased stuff with him and Punk in the past. But Drew and Punk has kind of become the thing now. What does Rollins do coming out of this? Well, that's why I was thinking that they might not have pulled the trigger on Gunther for poor old Seth or give him something to do. But with, with this, uh, you could start building Punk and McIntyre now and not have to have it for 8 to 12 weeks if you do it right. So... How long has it been since it's been since Jade has been three months already, two and a half months. You know, we'll see what happens. But we got a new world champion, Damian Priest. And there's another guy. There was a, now is a chance to do something different with him and elevate him. Let's see what they do. No more of these backstage segments playing darts with his friends. He needs to get a big head and, and leave the clubhouse for the judgment day and have his own private locker room. They got to knock, except for Rhea. Well, she I don't can come know. in any time. You know what? Him celebrating with the judgment day at the top of the ramp was one of the cool moments. Because you could tell that was more real than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's their guy. He's the world champion now. Look at how far they've come from being Edge's two people, just Rhea and, and uh, Priest, in the original judgment day. I forgot about that. Tony Khan has made it so I've almost forgotten about Edge. 
Anyway, speaking of forgetting about things, I wish I could. What was next? Um, Snoop Dogg was there, and then Bubba Ray Dudley came to the ring to be the special referee of what else in Philadelphia? They had a garbage match with furniture of some description. What did they call it? The six man with Philadelphia street fight. There you go. Of course it had to be. And they put poor Bobby Lashley in there with the rest of this dreck. The authors of Incompetence, Carrion Cross, Scarlet, poor Paul Ellering, he's still there. And and they broke a bunch of tables. I I couldn't I couldn't watch this. What the fuck? Did anybody Well, uh, it wasn't very good, and I don't think too many people cared, and a lot of it's booking-related. McAfee said this is the first WrestleMania Ellering's been involved in. He was at WrestleMania 8. Gene Okerlund, the famous introduction of, Get ready, here they come! And then the Road Warrior, the Legion of Doom, came out with Ellering for the first time in WWE, and then a few weeks later he found Rocco in uh, the rubble of Chicago. (laughs) But this match wasn't very good. You know, everyone's talking about CM Punk returning to WWE and guys who have chosen AEW over WWE. Jay Cargill chose WWE. Not a lot of people talking about Snoop Dogg jumping back. Remember, he was on AEW TV. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Hall of Famer Snoop Dogg back in the fold. Is Shaq next? Did they ever find him? After they put him in the ambulance. I'm telling you, he has to roll up in an ambulance whenever he next appears on one of these wrestling shows just to continue the story. He shows up in an ambulance. He, the ambulance could pull up, the doors open, and he slides out on wheels and slides right to the ring. This was a Philadelphia street fight. Bubba Ray Dudley got a nice pop, and it was a nice thing to have him there. It was kind of fitting. I'm not knocking Bubba. I'm just knocking furniture matches with underneath talent. But sadly, based on what this was and what it followed... And kind of knowing what else was left in a night, there are certain matches you're like, I got to go outside and smoke a joint now because I don't want to miss anything from the next match. Oh, you're saying that's what the people in the stadium all did. I'm saying that's what I did here in last stadium at last. Oh, Manor. okay. Yeah, I went you into the par- right. I went into the parking garage here at last Manor. And I smoked. I <laughs> I understand you have a full size replica of the Roman Colosseum in your backyard. Is that true? I'm not confirming anything. Well, L.A. Knight and A.J. Styles was up next in their big grudge showdown. And they they had a hot start to this thing, and they had a fight. And I like this again, because both these guys can work, and they know how to wrestle. They had a quick pace. It was aggressive. And there was no furniture involved. There was no gymnastics. They they. Had a fucking wrestling match, at a, imagine that, with ill intent toward each other. And I, I was disappointed that this time, instead of the big leap to the top and a suplex, L.A. Knight did a leap to the top and a German, and the camera missed the jump. Did you see that? I get you didn't I see did. Did no, you I, notice that you didn't see that? No, I did see that. I watched this match. I didn't see the jump, well, but, but I saw that they missed it. it. Because, yeah. I yeah. saw that they missed the jump. Well... Most other people might not have known there was a... And they didn't replay it. He was already up on the top when they... Re- anyway, that was his WrestleMania jump. Uh, but AJ was a heel. He got heat. LA Knight's a baby face. He makes comebacks. Um, I mean, again, two guys that know what they're doing. AJ's not... His strongest point has not been promos, but he's good in the ring. They turned it on. And finally, after a very quick and... Jazzy back and forth. L.A. Knight hit his fucking finish. Boom, one, two, three. So again, you know, L.A. and the people love him. They're, yeah, and his brain's out. And this was the perfect thing to do because this had been his first WrestleMania, they said. Unless he was in the crowd when Ellering found Rocco or whatever. No, that so, wasn't at WrestleMania. That was in between WrestleMania and I know I'm, I'm fucking with you because I don't care either way. How about that? You don't care about Rocco? How about them apples? I don't care about Rocco. I well, don't care about... I don't care about... Paul Ellery's brief run as a ventriloquist manager. Rocco you or care. Dumbo or... Yeah, it, it, I never knew. I knew Paul did the Iditarod. I didn't know he was a ventriloquist, but... 
<laughs> but he went back to L.A. Knight. Good match, right finish. Uh, boom, there we go. L.A. Knight still on the ascent. What'd you think? Good match, the right length. I thought A.J. was good here. I thought L.A. was good here. The fans were into it. Getting better temperature than night one. And this was kind of like a, almost every match, leave the fans happy night. Good match. And I think it's, it, you know, it was important that there wasn't any tomfoolery. They just gave LA Knight a good win because AJ Styles has been the WWE champion in the past and won big ones and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, besides sending the folks home happy, this did something for, for good old LA. Here's a, a trivia question for you. Has anyone, how can I ask this? Has anyone ever been involved in the WrestleMania main event and inducted to the Hall of Fame in the same weekend? You mean, how, in what sense? What do you mean? Well, Paul Heyman. He's in the corner involved in the main event, but he got inducted to the Hall of Fame it's the same weekend. Oh, I'm sure they've done something with someone, and I just can't think of it. Well, I mean, done something, but not like he may have come out unscheduled to run in. I mean, they just had people do that here in this match we're going to talk about. But I'm talking about regularly scheduled, still on top of the cards. Already, Heyman's got a bunch of firsts here, but he's still on top of the cards. He was booked to be in the main event at WrestleMania with his man, and he's inducted to Hall of Fame same weekend. Boy, he, I wonder if he bought a lottery ticket this weekend. I would have, and I never do that. Anyhow, so the U.S. title match was up next, the triple threat Logan Paul versus Kevin Owens versus Randy Orton. And, Brian, what do I always think about triple threat three-way matches? What do I always say about them? Well, you don't like them. Yeah. I don't I would say they suck. Yeah. Can't make it make sense. It's fucking stupid. They abuse the goddamn rules, bring a bunch of garbage in, blah, blah, blah. This was perfect. This was my favorite match all weekend. I loved this match. I can't praise this match enough. This match did not offend me. Is that high enough praise for you? I'm shocked. I mean, I know you love Kevin, not Kevin. Uh, yeah, I know you love Logan Paul, and he's great. He's one of my favorite guys in there, and you're a big Randy Orton guy, and you've always appreciated the good points of Kevin Steen's career and tried to push him with those. <laughs> but again, three-way matches. Well, well, explain why you love this one so much. Because it made sense, and they didn't just do stunts. They They had a match that told a story, and had some type of logical reason for everything that I don't know about every single goddamn thing. Somebody will pick, but it was a logical reason for it to transgress this way because Owens and Orton had bonded over their mutual hatred of Logan Paul, but there can only be one winner. So at first, even to the point where on the entrance uh, Owens drives down in a golf cart and then backs up and picks up Orton and they both come in together. And they both go after Logan Paul and they do the thing where they drop him on the desk and they're beating him up together. And, but then after a couple minutes, both of them go for a cover at the same time and realize it. And fucking Owens is like, are we going to do this now? You know, only one of us can win. Oh, let's go back to this guy. And as soon as they go back to beating up Logan Paul, Randy tries to RKO Kevin from behind, but he slips it and then everybody's, Ooh, they've got the, they got the people hooked. They understand what's going on. And then Owen said, you want to do it now? So then they have a big fucking fight. And now Logan Paul has the opportunity to level both of them with a double buckshot lariat. And then I couldn't keep up with uh, the, the twists and turns of things they were doing, but every time that Orton and Owens would get into it, then that would give Logan Paul a chance to recover and then come back in and be the heel. So there was still a heel, Logan Paul. There were two baby faces, Owens and Randy Orton, but Orton is a snake. And both of them had a goddamn an incentive 
to fuck with each other, but at the same time, nobody went out and tried to end each other's careers by pulling out a fucking chainsaw. They were wrestling. And, I mean, Logan Paul is fantastic, but it's great for him to be in there with a guy like Orton because at one point they went to trade the forearms, right? The uppercut forearms. And Orton, on the job training, was... <laughs> trying to show him and did end up showing him the rhythm. He's like, where to put his arms? He'd grab Logan Paul's arms and put it down. And he'd hit him, and he'd try to get him the rhythm exchange, and Logan Paul got it and won the exchange. But it's on-the-job training for this guy, but he's fucking great. And then Orton gave a double draping DDT to both Owens and Logan Paul. And then they start going to the big fucking two counts, and finally, Logan Paul gets his brass knucks. That's the only thing. Can you think of anything else that they really did to exploit the fact that a uh, triple threat is a no DQ besides having the knucks in broad daylight? No. And the, obviously, the knucks also have been established as a thing with Logan Paul. Yes. And that's the thing, is they didn't have to put a hat on a hat because it was no disqualification. They didn't have to go out there and tear up the whole goddamn stadium they did all this athletic shit in the ring in such a way that the people were following the story of the match and then logan paul out of desperation gets the knuckles and he swings but orton ducks but logan gets him the second time two count holy shit and then logan paul nails owens with the knucks and tr goes to pick orton up but orton hits an rko and they both sell it and then Orton gets the knucks, but he gives them to the referee and goes for his kick. But then the prime bottle pulls Logan Paul to safety. Now, can I stop you real quick? Yes. When Logan Paul first came out and the prime bottle was on the stage with him, doing like this mediocre dance almost, you're thinking right away, who's in the goddamn prime bottle? From the moment he came out, who's in there and what are they going to do? Which one of his stooges will it be? And I actually really liked the stuff with the Prime Bottle. It wasn't as goofy as it sounds. Well, yeah, and the Prime Bottle is was uh, revealed to be who the fuck is it? What's the guy's name? He's another one of people in Logan Paul's world. He's a big streamer. That's what they said. He's a big streamer. Well, that's probably because of that fucking bladder kidney issue he's got. But they've got pills for that these days. Anyway... The prime bottle pulled Logan Paul out, and then when Orton went out there, the bottle shoved Orton, and Orton just fucking booted the guy about halfway across the fucking ringside, and then picked him up and gave him an RKO on the desk, and then Logan Paul took the opportunity to run Orton into the post, but then Owens powerbombed Logan Paul and stunnered Orton and got a two count but then Owens went for the pop-up, and Owen and Orton hit the RKO, and Logan Paul shit-canned Orton to the floor and hit splash off the top on Kevin Owens, one, two, three. What a splash, too. Did you see that oh, yeah. splash? But this was, this is... I rescind the statements that I've made that it is impossible to have a good three-way triple threat match because they just did it. It's just apparently exceedingly difficult because this is the first time it's been done. But... Bravo, bravo, and a, a small smattering of future Farmer Association of America um, applause for Kevin Owens, Logan Paul, and Randy Orton. How good is Logan Paul? Tremendous. Everything he's involved with is amazing, and it's great. By, way, by the way, we didn't even talk about what did you think of WrestleMania having the prime bottle in the center of the ring? Well, I mean, it's not offensive. You know, it's not like that's all you're thinking about when you're because the show looks so good in all the other ways. It's not like, and they also had the turnbuckle. But it, it's it's subtle there. It's there, and then the WWE logos on a second one, and then the bottles on the bottom one, and you know. And then they announced a different drink is now the official energy drink at WWE. And I thought his drink Prime was an energy drink. I guess it's not. That's well, I not thought. They said that's now the official, what is it, hydration drink? <laughs> Whatever they call it. It's the it. hydration station. But I, th I thought, the, the, is the new official drink the gin and juice? No, that was a different drink that was sponsoring a different match. I think it's C4. That's what it is. See, I thought that was a vertebrae or an explosive. 
It is. It's also uh, a vertebrae exploding drink, apparently. Well, don't tip it back too far, folks. You'll break your fucking neck. I think the gin and juice should be the official drink because Snoop was sold on the idea. What's anyway, the- yeah. <laughs> we're moving on. Bailey versus EO. And I've already been cursed in my own home because Stacy said, oh, this was a good match. She had to watch this thing. She's in the art studio. She's working on her painting or whatever. She's got this on. She just likes to watch the girls' matches. Well, I can understand that. Well, hold on. You've never said this before. I know Stacy every now and then would watch some stuff. If she's watching the girls' matches, does she say anything to you about the girls' matches? Yeah, she loved this match. Not just this match, but any of the girls' matches. Well, she loves Rhea Ripley. But uh, but no, usually there's nothing to say to me about the girls' matches. Uh, but no, I'm, and I'm not not saying she's watching every week. She's watching WrestleMania. She's watching the big hoop de doo. If if Tony Khan's gonna lay an egg on live TV, she might pop in for that. But point is, she liked Bailey and EO. She was mad that I did not watch this entire thing. I got the general gist of Bailey winning with the big elbow drop. But this was, what, hour number 14 of the wrestling that we had seen in a 48-hour period or less, and I was running low on time and energy. So uh, did did you... Good match. uh, Very good match. EO Sky is really good. break it down for me minute by minute. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. Damage control, you know, they show them each and every week walking into the building when they get there. And if you watch Asuka and Kyrie saying they're so committed to their characters, and I don't know exactly what their characters are, but I get such a kick out of them. Io Sky is really, really good. Out of all the different women in the ring, she's actually really good in the ring. And this was a good match. And again, this was a night about giving fans happy moments other than Logan Paul. Bailey getting a big victory. The fans loved it. Bailey, new world champion. Except for Rhea, who's the other world champion. That's right. And we got more tag team champions now. At least they haven't split the uh, universal title up yet, where we'll have three. We'll see. But nevertheless, they introduced a bunch of celebrities at ringside that I've never heard of in my life, nor even seen their names written down on paper. Um, Am I missing anyone of any note that I should have known? Probably not. Okay. And then Snoop Dogg was back with his cheerleaders in the ring to announce the attendance. Now, the official attendance for night two, according to them, was 72,755. And Snoop Dogg announced the two-night total at 145,420, while the graphics said 145,298. I'm wondering if Snoop Dogg just had 420 on his mind and super, super disposed that over the real number. I don't know. I read an article a few months back that he stopped smoking weed. That was, I think that was a publicity stunt. Was it? Yeah. I didn't pay attention to part I can't two. remember what the resolution was of it, but it was some, it was a, 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 Beginning of a plug for a new product he's involved in. Oh, I didn't see part two of the story. I only saw the first day's story. Well, and I don't remember the rest of the story, so we'll move on and finish the story. See how that worked? We're going to move on to the story getting finished because it was time for our main event for the Universal title, Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns, the second encounter at WrestleMania, the rematch from last year. And we got Cody's entrance now with Brandy. Yeah. How about that? I'm happy about that. And he had the long entrance. He gave his weight belt to a small child. He hugged Michelle at ringside. The whole nine yards. People are ready for this. Another Sergeant Pepper patriotic red, white, and blue outfit. And then Roman Reigns got a choir and an orchestra. And they announced that he's had 31 title defenses in 1,300 whatever days. What's the math on that? Is that is that fucking eight a year, ten a year? I guess. Um, and they've made it work. 
That's the amazing part. But you know, you know what? And that, but that's the thing, I guess, because that used to be a knock on wrestling in the territory days by the people or the newspapers or whoever that wanted to knock it. Well, these guys wrestle every night. Where do you see that in any other sport? You know, and it is true when the Southern heavyweight title was being defended 250 times a year or whatever. Um, so uh, Roman Reigns with 31 defenses in four years is like a UFC fighter or a boxer at this point. So it does kind of give it a little more credibility. And also, I bet he's laughing that he gets paid the money he does. And when you divide it and prorate it amongst the matches, it looks more impressive. Have you noticed the handheld camera on the in-ring intros is either some kind of extra high-def, ultra-high-def, three-dimensional high-def camera with a soft focus in the background? It, it looks almost like a video game type of thing. Have you noticed those, those shots yet? I've noticed it, yeah. I'm wondering what some... This is new shit since I've been in a TV truck. But some of, of our uh, devoted followers out there, tell me what kind of fucking camera they're using. What is this new technology that we're seeing, this witchcraft? So the time was for the title match, and they had the face-off, and they were in no hurry, and the crowd was hot. And if you notice, again, Roman Reigns never breaks. He never has a facial expression or an attitude that he should not have if the moment that he is in at that current time was actually happening. And I had high hopes for this match. I wanted to like it. And then at two minutes in, when Cody pulled the table out from under the ring and shoved it in the ring, I was like, oh, God damn it. And Roman stopped him and put the table back to get some, and the people booed. And I was like, yes, yes, thank God. But it made sense, Cody, doing that. He has to overcome yeah. the odds. It's bloodline rules. So I wasn't offended by that. I was just hoping they wouldn't go that quick, right? I didn't know where they were going, but geez, already. And, but then seconds later, Roman had the kendo stick, but they didn't, they didn't overuse it. Cody got it away from him and used it and then dumped it out or lost it or whatever. And much of this was they had to do the over the rail into the arena where they could take a bump on an empty table in the back, but then they came back to the ring. And they built this, and more importantly, I guess they feel like they have to do those stupid things, you know, to satisfy the modern audience. So we'll give them a little of this and then get back to business. But they they built where Cody even had levels of comeback where he would get a flurry. But then something would happen where he'd get shut down. But then the next time that he had a flurry, it'd be more of a flurry. They 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 built very well through the thing. Um, you know, and, and again, it was about going for their finishing moves. There was a spot where Roman had nutshotted Cody after he cleared the desk off and power bombed him through the desk. And they got to the ring and he hit the Superman punch, but only got a two count. But then Cody, and, and then they would sell in between these things. Again, it wasn't like the AEW shit. But then Cody might hit the Cody cutter and get a two count, or a spear and get a two count. But then finally, they, they teased the moves as much as they hit them with going for the crossroads and blah, blah, blah. And then finally, Cody hits the crossroads, and Jimmy Uso comes in and super kicks him. And then they start doing the... You know, the, the the kind of thing that they do all the time with the bloodline, but at least they souped it up for WrestleMania here shortly. No, this was great. You can't criticize this. It well, I can't. That's, that's what I'm saying. You know, it it started out, oh, there's Jimmy. Oh, there's Solo. But then, then it gets grander. But Jimmy comes in with the super kick, and he holds Cody for the Superman punch, but music plays, and here comes Jay, and they get the Jay and Jimmy get in a fight and they spear or Jay spears Jimmy off the stage. And so they're neutralized. But then in the ring, the match is still going on. Roman Reigns hits the spear and gets a two count and a huge pop when Cody kicks out. 
And then Roman gets a face lock, but Cody pushes him to the floor and Cody spears him through the barricades. There go all the big spots. And Cody rolls Roman in. And he grabs him for the crossroads and hits two crossroads, but then as he's going for the third, Solo is there and spikes Cody. And he puts Roman on top of Cody and turns around to walk off. One, two, he kicks out. And fucking, so and it's a pop there too, and Solo turns around like, what the fuck? So Solo gets on Cody and then tells Roman, finish him. So Roman struggles up to his feet and spears Cody. One, two, kick out. And Solo's bullshit, and then music plays. Here comes John Cena. <laughs> the place explodes. No one thought this was happening. Good now that they're bringing out all the goddamn stars, right? We don't care if you thought he was here, whatever. Cena runs down, makes a comeback on Solo that, as we will recall, Solo's the one to spike Cena and put him out of commission. And he gives Roman Reigns the attitude adjustment and then clears the Spanish announce desk off and attitude adjusts, adjusts the attitude of Solo through that. And right as that, the rock music plays. And here comes the rock to the ring. And now we've got the face off with John Cena. And the crowd is going batshit. And let's face it, again, I said it was the same kind of shit when Jimmy runs in or Solo runns in, but now you've got Cena and Rock face-to-face -face as an unadvertised bonus in Philadelphia. These people are going out of their minds. And Rock Rock bottoms him and says, get the fuck out of my ring. It gets bleeped. He's cursing and, like he's Shane Douglas oh, and ECW at this yes, point. He's just saying fuck it just to, to show everybody that he can do it. And he takes his belt off like he's going to whip the shit out of Cena and music plays. And here comes Seth to the ring with a chair. Well, it's shield music. That's the music from the shield. Ah, true. Well, I didn't recognize it. And I Seth came out there with like blonde that. hair, dressed like he did in the shield. But, I but think a lot of fans thought Moxley, though. In that moment, a lot of fans, when they oh, heard that music, they did think that. But thankfully, they were not. They were not that unlucky. They got Seth. But the thing is, when Seth, I thought Seth would get a moment with The Rock, but Seth gets in the ring with a chair going after The Rock, and Roman from the blind side, you bam, stopped him, and that was the end of Seth. Well, no, but that was a big thing. Again, if you... It, well, again, The Shield, yes. Well, no, but and it's well, kind of brilliant for the long-term storytelling. No, Roman. but I'm not talking about the second time he hit him. I'm talking about the first time oh, he hit oh, him. Oh, okay. Because he, when Seth was going in with the chair after the Rock, at least there could have been some kind of interaction with Rock there. But Roman just cut Seth off before he got to do anything, and Rock was still about to whip Cody. See, and that's when we got bong, and here came the Undertaker, and the lights are out, and the light. Well, not here came the Undertaker, but bong, you know he's coming. And the lights go out, and when the lights come on, he's already in the ring behind the rock. And there's where he hits the choke slam. And then the lights go out, and when they come back on, he's gone. But now... And he was dressed like he was, you know, the thug undertaker, not like the dead man. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, you it can't... It worked. It worked. I'm not complaining. Yeah, you, you can't expect him to actually change clothes for a WrestleMania appearance. Come on! It worked, but you. no, it, it worked because that's the, the that's the person they now see as the Undertaker. Yeah, for this audience. But anyway, now Roman and Cody are laying there in the ring. There's a chair laying there. The weight belt is laying there, and they're both going for it. But now Roman gets the chair, and he stands up, and Seth is pulling himself up to his feet, and he Roman can either hit Cody, or he can hit Seth. Yeah. And now he turns, because now is the part, I know from the shield, that's what, and they've showed the tape, so everybody else does also, that when, when they broke up, there was the chair shot from behind, well now Roman gets to return it onto Seth, but when he does that, bam, and he levels Seth, he goes for a spear on Cody, and Cody stops him with a kick, and hits three crossroads, and the cover, one, two, three. And finishes the story. And that's why I was saying earlier, I thought Seth should have got been able to get in and do some kind of duck dodge thing with the rock before he got laid out because then he's he just gets up and he gets laid out again 
before we get to the post match, and there's a lot to talk about then. Obviously, you're excited because you're banging the desk nonstop. Well, yes, over I'm here. just, I'm just, it's, it's just a, a barn burner there, a, a pier sixer. It was a good match, but it was an exceptional series of moments. Yes, that were incredible to see live. Uh, I wasn't there, but just on TV as it happened, it was great. The long term booking of and, I, you know, just by happenstance, not that they planned this out 10 years ago, or whatever, but the idea that he got Rollins back for what he did to him. It was his chance to finally do it after all these years. And that cost him the match. Yeah. That's so interesting. That's such an interesting concept just to play with. I love this. I thought this was great. In the same way I love matches sometimes that aren't in-ring classics. It all worked for this here built up incredibly and then of course you get the big moment in the post match yeah and and if there'd been again multiple run-ins with you know Joe Cephas and fucking Tits McGee it may have been but this is the rock this is John Cena this is the goddamn undertaker it's wrestlemania that worked it, you, if the glass had broken they would have set the stadium on fire that's the only thing they were missing I was thinking that in some fashion, that might be the three count, was Austin to come out to count the three. Well, I said that the other day on the show. Imagine if the glass breaks and that's who could stop the rock. There were three options. It's Triple H, it's Steve Austin, and The Undertaker. And it worked. It worked. Everyone was happy that this, no one expected The Undertaker in the middle of this, and it worked. Yeah. And well, and Triple H isn't an option right now because they've got a long story down the road for that. No reason at all to get jumpy about that one. But then Brandy came to the ring. Cody held the belt up. They met the first member of the Rhodes family to win the WWE title. And they sent the top baby faces. They're uh, Sammy and Seth and Jay and Owens, Orton, Cena. Punk was there. L.A. Knight. Uh, Mama Rhodes and the family. And uh, Brody Lee Jr. Was he? I, yeah. Well, I don't really know what the kid looks like with that. Negative mask one on. under the mask. Yeah, he was the kid. Remember, he was at ringside last year, and then Cody lost, and he was there this year for this. Well, he got booked back for the return, too. Um, and, and that was the kind of, you know, the old scene you'd see when Dusty would win the, the, the NWA title or even the Florida title or whatever title. All the other baby faces would come in and pick him up. It was a celebration. And then when Cody had hugged everybody and shook hands with the announcers and everything. Oh, and, and also he called out um, not only uh, the Artful Dodger, Bruce Pritchard, but also Triple H to thank them for their part in uh, his return to the WWE and, and gave them big hugs. And he and Triple H had the the heartfelt moment. Uh, but then, it, like I said, when he shook hands, the announcers hugged the camera guy. There was Nick Khan in the front row. And they had a moment there and, and a nice little congratulatory deal. So Cody's the biggest star in the business now, except for the, it'll always be except for the rock, but is the rock really in the business or what, you know, you had to finish your sentence and you started correcting yourself. Well, yeah, well, because <laughs> I mean, here's the, even if Rock wasn't on the oh. board of directors, you, I'm just convinced that that personality, the magnitude of him, you cannot be a bigger star than the Rock, no matter who's calling the shots. It's just not possible. You know, we're not going to go too much longer just because this already is a giant size episode. We'll record the drive through in a few days so we can catch our breath and edit all these shows. But Cody in the press scrum afterwards, or the press conference as they call it in WWE, you know, he said, and it's a very interesting thing, he had been wondering to himself, what's next after this? If his whole career, if the whole story of his whole career is the story of the chase, of completing the story of his father, and now he's done it, what's next? So this is going to be very interesting. How do they capitalize on this with Cody? Because he's no longer chasing anything. Maybe The Rock, because of the insults about his mom, pinned him night one. But again, other than the made-up title that The Rock gave himself, claiming that Muhammad Ali bestowed the title <laughs> on him, who, what do you think's next for Cody? Well, I mean, there's 
obviously going to be, depending on how that all these people interact with each other and what the plans are, because Cody and Rock is a big money match. Rock and Roman could potentially be a big money match. Why is there tension between Rock and Roman with some of the things that happened, including the miscue in the tag match? I don't even know whether we mentioned that uh, Roman... Speared Rock accidentally when Seth pulled Cody out of the way at one point. That's right. See, Seth really, again, plays into everything. He said, I'll be your shield. Yeah. He literally was the shield for Cody Rhodes to win the title here. So you've got potentially It's great Roman storytelling. It's really yes. good. Yes. But I'm saying with these matches, you've got Roman and Seth, but you got potentially Cody and Rock. You've got Rock and Roman. you got Roman and Seth. You have a rematch with Roman and Cody that could go to Saudi Arabia. You Stephanie have... versus Gewurz. Oh, come on now. Heyman uh, is the referee. You have, you have Orton as established as a top guy, being kind of a wild card that could be involved with Orton, or with Orton, with uh, Roman, or with Rock, potentially. There's all these other names. Logan Paul, what the fuck is going on? We don't know how they're going to tell whatever story they're going to tell between Rock and Roman, whether they're going to stay aligned, split up, who's going to go what way, where first. But depending on that, they've got a lot of shit that they can pull out of their bag right now. Here's another thing, and I know Triple H said that the draft is coming up, so they're going to continue to do that. It always is a big ratings night for them. Which champion is on which show? Well, Because Cody was on question. Raw, and now he's the champion of the guy who was predominantly only on SmackDown and Priest and the entire stable on Raw until they're broken up in the draft. Well, and, and again, how does it affect toward the end of this year? Because we're, what are we, eight months away from a lot of shit changing with them going to, the Netflix thing starts in eight months, right? In, in January? It starts in, I believe they leave TV in October, I want to say, and they but, return to Netflix in January. Yeah, but they don't leave all of TV because uh, the other show is still, I'm so confused, but they're still going to have a show on fucking USA is just going to be the other show, right? What the fuck is, is they're going to be all over the place. And what about Gunther? Gunther lost this title, but he's been so dominant. Could he immediately be put into a situation where he is a, potential challenger and he and Cody that could be incredible because Cody can sell his ass off so uh, they got plenty to do to keep busy well night one maybe a bit underwhelming and cold frigid <laughs> night two a night of happy moments for the fans and you know Cody got the kind of celebration and not too many guys have gotten over the last 30 years Sting got it at the bash in 90 Obviously, Dusty always got it. How many videos of Manny Fernandez hugging him in the ring? Are there? <laughs> yes, Manny Fernandez should have hit the ring and hugged Cody. <laughs> but uh, a big moment, a really cool moment, I guess the big thing will be how do they move forward to Cody now that he's completed the story? What's next? And with the bloodline, especially if Jacob Fatu's on the way, it can go a whole bunch of different ways. So a lot of interesting things coming out of WrestleMania. And and you know, to, Jacob Fatu did not debut because, remember, I said you don't debut a secret weapon in a losing effort. And it'll be interesting to see whether that's an immediate follow-up on the Raw that happens tonight as we speak, the Raw after WrestleMania, or whether this is something he's going to filter in and play into something some other way. But we'll we'll find out. And when do we finish our story? When are we done with these programs? We're done with this program right now, unless uh, I could check for Twitter and see if there's any but big news happening. We're, we're never really done, though, because there's always another one to do. 